So let me tell you a little bit about WE. We recognize as the USPTO that while women represent the fastest growing category of entrepreneurs worldwide, they are less likely to secure the capital and intellectual property protections they need, and they are severely underrepresented as business owners compared to men. According to the U.S. Census Bureau's annual business survey, while men have an ownership stake in about 80% of U.S. businesses and a majority ownership share in 63% of U.S. businesses, women hold an ownership stake in about 37% of U.S. businesses and only had a majority share in 21%. The USPTO's Women's Entrepreneurship Initiative provides a community-focused program that lifts women up and taps in their into their potential to increase equity, job creation, and economic prosperity through recognizing their ideas, insights, and innovations. This program launched in November of 2022 and is moving forward quickly and with vigor. It builds on the proven success of the USPTO's Women's Entrepreneurship Symposium and features advice from those who have made it, as well as resources to help women protect their IP, fund their ideas, and expand their network of mentors and advisors. As I mentioned today, not only do our NAI members and annual meeting attendees have the opportunity to attend this month's WE program, because this is a monthly series, the USPTO has invited the world to tune in virtually to hear women leading in science, technology, engineering, and math share their innovation journeys, including how they are leveraging their intellectual property protection to achieve success. This is just another example of the close working relationship held between the USPTO and the National Academy of Inventors. It is my pleasure at this time to call to the stage the moderator for our panel, and it's none other than Jamie Renee, the Executive Director of the NAI. Jamie? Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. We are excited that this is our first live streaming panel discussion at the Academy. We hope we do a good job and it won't be the last. I'm excited to have our panel uh, introduce themselves. As Elizabeth said, my name is Jamie Renee and I serve as the Executive Director for the National Academy of Inventors. Good afternoon. My name is Almisha Campbell. I currently serve as the Assistant Vice President for Research and Economic Development at Jackson State University in Jackson, Mississippi. Good afternoon. I'm Carol Figali Bostwick. I'm a professor in the Department of Medicine at the Medical University of South Carolina and Associate Dean for Faculty Affairs. I also direct a new program, Coaching and Entrepreneurial Resources for Women or CREW program. Hello, I'm Elizabeth Leboa. I'm Provost and Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs at SMU in Dallas, Texas. Hi, I'm Cassandra Quave. I'm an Associate Professor of Dermatology and Human Health at Emory University, where I also serve as the Curator of the Herbarium and Assistant Dean of Research Course for the School of Medicine. I'm also the founder of two companies, um, Phytotech and Verdant Scientific. Thank you. So the theme for our discussion today is Vision to Value, Women Inspiring STEM Through Intellectual Property. I'm going to start with you, Cassandra. If you could share with the audience what inspired you to pursue a career in STEM and what pivotal moments or experiences uh, did you have along your career path? Thanks. So I was really fortunate to grow up in the state of Florida where we were kind of raised on the awe of NASA, um, taking on field trips to the Edison home and engaged in science fairs. Um, as some of you can see in the audience, I'm disabled, so I wasn't able to really participate in sports. Science became my sport um, as a child. And so I think the most important things that we should think about in the future for inspiring students is to give them many opportunities for engaging with science and, um, you know, throughout their, their careers or throughout their, their tenure as students. Later in my development, I was able to participate in courses on entrepreneurship, on how to write SBIR proposals, um, and 
really get that additional background and what it takes to move science beyond the lab. Thank you. Elizabeth, um, I know you also have an interesting journey in STEM. Could you share with the audience? Uh, happy to. It's uh, absolutely not as, as linear. Uh, I actually had no thoughts on STEM uh, when I was a child. I, I grew up in a suburb of, uh, in California, in a suburb of Sacramento, a very small town that uh, had recently been hit by a big loss in public funding for K-12 education. So uh, I went through high school, did not do the SAT, was not sure what I was going to do, and started off at junior college with absolutely no idea. While I was in junior college waitressing, I took a biology class and fell in love with it, thought I might want to go down a pre-med path, um, but realized that I couldn't think I could stand it if I was responsible if someone were to really get hurt or die or something like that. At the same time, during my junior college, I started taking some math courses and found out I was actually pretty good. So I went down the path thinking I want to do something with what was called engineering, which I didn't know anything about, um, and medicine, biology. So I finished community college, and because of the programs they had at the time, I was able to get an auto admission into UC Davis where I got accepted into engineering. Um, one of, I'd say, I, I, I never saw women in my classes, I'll, I'll share that for sure, but as I progressed, I uh, just started doing some research and I got to do research as an undergrad and decided I really wanted to go on to grad school. And frankly, it was then uh, where I could do a combination of things that could combine my love of trying to help humanity medically. Uh, bioengineering didn't exist at the time at Stanford when I got accepted for grad school, but uh, they had a great pro program in mechanical engineering and uh, ended up doing a biomechanical engineering program and staying in academia. Uh, the path goes a, a lot further once uh, from the IP perspective, which was more with trying to solve problems with uh, my one of my children's injuries. But um, other than that, it, it was a very convoluted path, and, and frankly, at the time, I never thought that I would I would do it, but thrilled I did. <laughs> Thank you. Carol, we were talking backstage, and you said you faced some unique challenges in your pursuit uh, within the STEM field and academia as it relates to pursuing IP. Could you share with us some of those and how you overcame them? Um, sure. My path started um, in a slightly more challenging way because I was going to the American University of Beirut in Beirut during the war, um, and I ended up having to change paths because it was not safe to cross over to the side where the medical school was. I decided to do a master's and ended up falling in love with research and decided I wanted to do research full time ended up in graduate school at Tulane. And then when I became a postdoc and then a faculty, um, I realized I had this observation in the lab that there was this black box. I didn't know what to do with it, where to go. It wasn't something that we were taught in grad school. It's not something that you're taught in medical school. Um, and it was very challenging for a lot of reasons. One, I lacked the procedural knowledge, so I didn't know how to get there. But there was also this implicit bias that impacted me that is basically the, the influence that others have in making you feel as if you don't have the um, capabilities or the abilities to see this through as an invention. So those combinations of effects made me realize that if I feel that way, then so do others. Um, and decided to start programs that provide entrepreneurship training for other women who may be struggling with the same issues. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. Cassandra, you also had some challenges along the way. Do you mind sharing that with the audience? Sure. I mean, I definitely can, can um, say I've experienced implicit biases in, in science as well. Um, I had the opportunity to write a book a couple of years ago. It's called The Plant Hunter, A Scientist's Quest for Nature's Next Medicines. And I actually included a chapter on what some of those biases have looked like. Um, there are a couple of prototypical 
engagements. There's a professor toad, the professor who, you know, these are nicknames I gave them, the professor that asks me continuously, why am I in a place, not understanding why I'm at this meeting or um, why I'm present in certain places of work. Um, there's Professor Creeper, who is, you know, the typical uh, sexual harasser that I've encountered um, in my career. And then um, there's the Professor Snake, who's kind of a little bit slippery and tries to undermine your work. So I've encountered all of these creatures in different forms, and I apologize to any amphibian enthusiast. <laughs> but um, it definitely puts a toll, it brings an extra toll on, on the work that, that you do. Now, when you're thinking about going that next step beyond just what we do in academic research and really trying to dip your toe into the entrepreneurial environment, mm -hmm. um, the odds are not necessarily in our favor. Around 25% um, of, of, of startups are founded by women. And of all VC funds, I think the estimate's around 2% of that money goes to women-founded businesses. Now, when you wrap in um, disability, the numbers are even a bit more dire. 3% of the STEM workforce um, identifies as being um, disabled. And um, there was a recent study that estimates that it's around 400 times harder to get um, venture capital as a disabled founder. So I really have the odds stacked against me. And so the lessons I've learned um, throughout these journeys has really been the value of persistence and the value of uh, aligning yourself with mentors um, and the value of partnership and collaboration. These are some of the lessons I've heard over the uh, today and yesterday about the importance of, of collaborate or, or perish. Um, and I think that definitely extends um, into this domain. So while there are challenges, I think that there are ways forward, and I think things are getting better. And I think it's so important to have groups like this particular panel um, speak openly about some of these challenges. Of any chapters in my book, it was interesting. The most um, polarizing responses I got to the entire book was that one chapter about people's interpretations of how I should or should not have responded to these different types of encounters. Um, and I think that's telling in itself as well. It is. And, and Almisha, I'm going to come to you. We, we heard from Cassandra and Carol some of the challenges. We know we've all faced sh challenges. They shared theirs with us today. We often think about what we can do different, and Cassandra was talking about the resilience and, and what she needed to do in order to withstand and, and to thrive in that environment. My question to you is, what can the STEM fields and academia do to create an environment to encourage more women to be involved? I think one of the things that my colleagues on the panel talked about is that implicit bias, and oftentimes we don't do implicit bias training. Mm -hmm. I think every department, every college should have those trainings that are mandatory um, on their campuses so that, they, you know, people say, oh, I'm not biased, but the, some of it is there because of the ways, the communities in which we, we are in, what we think people should do and how they should act. So if we have those implicit bias training, those would help for us to identify what they are mm -hmm. and then figure out how can we make those adjustments and having open conversations like this is very important not just in this setting but among in our departments you know in different areas so that people feel a bit comfortable um, i talked about earlier um, the fact that when I'm doing presentations, I'd rather bring someone else in to do the presentation because if I'm talking to uh, faculty that are accustomed to just be male oriented, then they want to know what does this young girl know about, you know, patenting and all of this stuff. And it's, it's sometimes challenging, but you bring someone else in to have a conversation and all of a sudden they go, okay, so Dr. Campbell really know what she was talking about because we speak from the same um, language. I think the other things that we can do um, and I always say this to men when I speak on, on these type of platforms, that you can be advocate for the women and the minorities that are in the room, that oftentimes when you see something, talk about it. Mm -hmm. Talk with your colleagues about the things that you observe. Have that one-on-one -one conversation that that, you know, that behavior modification can occur. Because if you're seeing it and you're not happy about it and you're not doing anything about it, then you're complicit. So be that advocate for us in those spaces. But oftentimes, um, when we look at the innovators and the entrepreneurs, we also have to look at the structure of the organizations in which we are in. I, I was talking to someone yesterday and I said, 
if in your organization they're not hiring enough women in, in senior positions as department chairs, as deans, and so forth, then those behaviors and those things will continue to occur. So we have to make sure in our hiring practices that we have things in place that we can see more uh, women coming in, we can see more minorities coming. And my colleagues at the Women Inventors um, Special Interest Group of Autumn develop some of those tools that you can use uh, to advocate for women in the space and to figure out how do we engage them more, how do we advocate for them and support them in some of the things they're doing. So the challenges in which women are going through they're not going to do it alone. We can highlight, we can talk about it, we can mitigate it. What about from the rest of the panel? Any suggestions that you have for the organization, for the field mm -hmm. to make changes, to make it more inviting for women to be involved? So, you know, I have such incredible hope. I, I, I know in a little bit of conversation we had behind the stage and, and what the stories that are being shared here, we've had uh, some incredible challenges in our careers, and, and I'm sure many in the audience have too with a lot of the conversations uh, and stories we're sharing now. That being said, I believe in my core that I think everybody really does want to do the right thing. I think we want to help each other. Um, Personally, I think what needs to happen across the STEM field is when we hear about this term mentoring, uh, mentoring is not enough. Uh, as I've progressed up the academic ladder, I, I look at how I, I poke, I prod, I push, I advocate. Um, junior colleagues to me across the country know that I am putting their names out there and unless they contact me and say, stop it, you know, I'm going to put them out there and put them up for positions. And I think all of us really want to not just see our field move forward, but make sure that our country stays competitive, that we truly are in a leadership role in, in technology and IP. And the reality is um, we have uh, an incredibly diverse population. And if we are not making it easier and more accessible for more of us, to contribute in this space, then it's only to the detriment of, of all of us and, and to the next generation coming up. Um, I can't agree more with what was set up here around the resilience and grit. I, I've got the stories I, I can share too. I love that toad, creeper. Uh, what was the last snake? Yeah, yeah. We've, we've all got some of those in our past. But that being said, I think those are the minority and not the majority, and I think the more we work to make our field as inclusive and diverse as possible, the more we will advance uh, as a society, as a country, technologically, because we need, we need those diverse uh, and interesting convoluted uh, areas to come together, and I'm not just talking race, gender, ethnicity. Innovation lies at the intersection, so the more we can bring those interesting intersections together, where we're going to move, uh, move just incredible work forward. So uh, I think we just have to each individually make that decision that we are personally going to uh, make the field more inclusive of, again, race, gender, ethnicity, diverse viewpoints, uh, areas, and it will really move all of us forward. Mm -hmm. Maybe leveraging on that, if I may, um, studies have shown that gender diversity really boosts productivity and value creation. And women constitute nearly half of the workforce in the U.S. And so not capitalizing on their ideas and their creativity is a loss to our economy and our growth. Mm -hmm. And there are several things organizations could probably do. One of the simplest and easiest is um, impression management strategies, highlighting the successes of the women, um, highlighting the role models out there to make other women realize that this is achievable, this is a goal they can get to, um, to also avoid the appearance of tokenism. I think that's critical. Um, resources to buy time. You know, we went through, all went through through COVID, and I think everybody knows that women, especially ju at the junior level of their um, the career phase, 
bore the brunt of the child care um, during COVID when all the daycare centers and the schools were closed. And I know from my experience directing a program at NUSC called Arrow for the Advancement, Recruitment, and Retention of Women, one of the main concerns um, these junior faculty and trainees were raising were, I just don't have time. I don't have time to write a grant. I don't have time to finish my manuscript. I don't have time to format it. So one of the activities we implemented to give them time to be more creative, to give them time to think, was to take some of these things off their plate. For example, one of the, the activities we implemented that we cover the cost for with our budget is to provide a manuscript editing uh, service where an editor gets hired to format the manuscript for whatever journal that faculty wants to submit to. And that takes that little busy work that takes time off their plates. Mm -hmm. The manuscript gets formatted for them and it gets, uh, they can just upload, it's ready to go. But these little things ultimately make a big difference because time is the most valuable aspect in being able to be creative and have time to think. And if we can buy them time, it just opens up this whole world of additional creativity for them. That's amazing. No, I totally agree on time. It is our most valuable asset. I wanted to talk about one other thing that I think hasn't been brought up yet, and that's when you identify something other beyond the norm, there's often a feeling of solitude or a feeling of being alone, the only one. And I'm really proud of some initiatives that our university, Emory, has taken in the past year through the leadership of our um, VP of Research, Dr. Deb Bruner, in collaboration with the Office of Tech Transfer. She, for the first time, brought together a group of women entrepreneurs that we had no idea existed within the university environment. And we had something called the Female Founders Forum, which basically brought together training opportunities, but most important, networking opportunities. It was those casual gatherings over dinner, over a glass of wine, talking about the struggles we're running into and pulling together our response to a patent examiner or getting that VC money of, of having those opportunities to, to discuss amongst each other and really to identify that peer network that we didn't know existed. Um, they've also brought in some new um, networking events where we have examples of successful women in, in, in science and entrepreneurship that come and speak. Um, and it gives us this opportunity to see what it takes to be successful and what their journey is like. And so I think these are two very simple things that many institutions could easily implement by helping um, women in entrepreneurship to really build that community. But it takes time, it takes investment, it takes commitment from institutions to put you know, some funds behind that to, to, to bring these networks together. And I really hope that initiatives like this continue to, to grow because it, it really is so important. Misha, I'm gonna come back to you and I'm gonna build off what Cassandra was saying around networking and the importance of lifting each other up. I'm curious, we've, we've now talked about what the organization should do, what we should do ourselves, but what should we do for each other? What are ideas where women who are in the IP space, entrepreneurs, innovators, and in STEM fields, how can we help each other? I think one of the things is show up, show up for each other. Um, when we know that someone is, you know, for example, on a, a panel, you know, show up, represent. Um, one of the things I did um, when I look at um, all the work that we were doing with Autumn and Women Inventors SIG, and then when I see what was happening on my own campus, um, started thinking, how can I help? Um, what can I do with the little skills that I have? And one of the things I did was work with my students to create um, a forum that we're going to in, in, um, bring in young uh, women, students, and faculty just to have conversation around IP. And that turned into Innovate Exchange, which I just did a pilot of Innovate Exchange, interviewing women at different universities who are engaged in innovation and entrepreneurship and talk about their journey. What are you working on? Tell me about your technology. Just get into know what they're doing and be able to showcase that on a YouTube channel. Just something that I thought of, hey, I have a mass communication background, let's use it. 
um, to showcase these women because oftentimes we don't see them. Mm -hmm. And when I'm working with faculty and, and encourage them to disclose and to work on IP related matters, they're saying, well, you know, I don't have the time, the same thing. They have childcare, they have a parent that they need to take care of. And they have all these challenges that they're going to, especially at my university, high teaching loads. And I said, okay, maybe if I bring these women to them in this type of format, they will see that these amazing women have some of the same challenges. They have some of the same, you know, workload and different things, and they can see how they were able to do it, like incrementally going into different programs. And so that was one of the ways I thought I can um, contribute to it. But also, when the Women Inventors Group came out, you know, with, with their steps of how you can support women and do different things, I said, well, I'll be, you know, an advocate for it. I'll showcase it. I'll make sure it gets on the platform. I'll make sure I join their podcast with them just as a supporting cast member, because they're the one who did the work, but wanted to be there in support of them. So one of the things, how can I help you? What are some challenges that you have that you see that I can help you? Let's talk about it. What are some things, can I come to your campus and have a talk with you know, a particular group of people? Is there some challenges you're having, whether it's in your IP, your tech transfer office, whether it's in your department? Say, so how can we share those stories? You know, um, I remember about two years ago, we had a conference at Autumn, and we just came up with this crazy idea to just have this round table for us to just talk about our issues. You know, it's a, like a way to, and we in the room, and the women were talking, and there were men that walk in. And we're looking around the room, and they're like, why are they in here? This is for women to commiserate and talk about our challenge in the IP world. And the men sat there, and they said, Hey, I, I'm the one taking care of these young kids. You know, this is what happened in my life. So I'm the kid taker for these young kids, plus my parent. And they were having some of the same challenges we had. We wouldn't have known that had we not created this roundtable discussion in a private area for us to talk. And we were having women that were from all ages, all background. And they were early, some were early in their career, some were mid career, and some were late stage. But we were all having that openness. And the fact that we were able to just, it felt cathartic that we were able to talk about a challenge in a, in a space that felt um, comfortable, a space that felt like we were protected and that we won't be judged. And just having that space, safe space, for us to have those conversations, I think is very critical for some of us because sometimes all we want to here is um, just a listening ear. And the earlier panel talked about the fact that we often think that we are by ourselves. We are the only one that's going through it. Mm -hmm. And as you hear from the three of us, you know, the three of you, you face some of the same challenges, but you wouldn't have known that had you not been in a setting like this and being open and honest. Mm -hmm. And I think that's key too. That's key because if we're keeping in the challenges that we're having and telling them everything is fine, I'm doing well, here's my patents, here's my company, and we're walking around and other people say, I must be the only person having a problem, so the problem must be me. And if we, we have been honest and we're sharing what's happening, other people would learn how you overcame those challenges. I love what you said about the fact that you, you're hopeful. You're hopeful that this will change because that those things that were described in your book and I love it too, you know, uh, especially the snake part, you know, because sometimes they're, they're very quiet, but you, you can hear the yes. coming, right? Um, but the fact that you were able to identify that, put them in different buckets and have those conversations and we're now looking at it and saying, I see that, I see you, uh, you know, I feel for you, I'm glad you were able to get that out, and now how do we move on together? So creating those opportunities for engagement, I think is critical for us as women. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would agree. Any ideas um, that you have for the next generation of women, how we can encourage the next generation of women maybe to do it different than we have and, and see STEM as an opportunity for them from a, for a career path? You know, from the academic side of the house, uh, I think what we're seeing in institutions across the country is uh, obviously the growth of women in, in college. They typically are outnumbering men in, in fields across the disciplines, um, but there is also continuing growth in STEM fields. Uh, I think, what we have to, and it's been relayed here beautifully uh, already, is not just serve as these mentors or uh, individuals who seem to have done it without being open and honest, but being truly open and honest. 
That being said, while imposter syndrome is not exclusive to one gender, it is known that it is much more prominent in women in science. And I think so when we think about the next generation coming up, it is having those conversations about helping to build confidence, the resilience, the grit, saying, yes, you can do it. Uh, it doesn't matter if you got a you didn't get a perfect straight A's, you know, or who's, who's doing that these days coming right out of COVID. So really ensuring that we're invoking that confidence, but also realizing the difference in a lot of ways of uh, how individuals get excited about technology. So um, I briefly commented that the IP that I got really going was because of as a mom, one of my children came home with an injury. The work I'd been doing in the lab, I had patented some of it, but the amount I got really excited about was one that uh, was a smart bandage that could re uh, address MRSA and other multidrug resistant bacteria while helping to regenerate skin. Well, I got excited about that because one of my daughters came home from Y camp with a really bad MRSA infection. So I think if we really want to bring this next generation uh, it's not just about the resilience, the grit, which is critical. We've got to get more of that in, and I'm saying that with my mom's hat on now, too. I think it's a real issue in this generation coming out of COVID. But it's also around building up the confidence and showing how technology is, is expansive enough and the work being done can be of interest to a lot of different people, a very diverse audience. Some tech might just be about how do we do SpaceX? Well, maybe that's something that happens to be of more interest to a certain gender. I, I don't know. But typically, from the standpoint of what the data has shown, those areas that have more of a social impact, those areas that have more of a, of a human and humanitarian touch from a technolog uh, technological standpoint, of course, of great interest to all of us, but those also will bring in uh, more women, young women in the field. Mm -hmm. I think also for the next generation, I would want them to know how critically important it is to have near peer mentoring. Mm -hmm. We have our program, our crew program involves forming small groups that depending on interests meet with senior mentors and it's great because they get to benefit from the wealth and breadth of expertise of senior uh, mentors but in some of the sessions the peer-to-peer -peer mentoring and tips are just amazing and i sometimes it's much more impactful than the senior mentors input so i think helping each other lifting each other up opening doors for each other you know if i'm meeting with a company that's interested in a, in my invention i would also say oh and by the way my colleague jamie has this other great thing she's working on i think we should bring her into the meeting with us so opening doors for each other and not relying on a single person yeah. Um, you can have a mentor, that's wonderful, but you really need an army of sponsors as well, because your mentor is not going to know everyone, is not going to be able to connect you to everyone, is not going to be able to open every door for you. So identifying sponsors and starting that process early, I think, is also important. I would add and say, oftentimes, some of us as women are the only one in some of these spaces. And um, it's okay to say I was the first, I was the only one, but I often tell people, don't just say it, make sure you're leaving the door open for the next person. And then you're showing them and teaching them how to get in there and you're providing access. You either bringing them along or you send them and call a colleague and say, hey, I'm sending so-and-so to this conference. Make sure you introduce it to two or three people. Um, because if you keep saying I'm the first, I, I'm the only one at the table, they surely will continue um, unless we do something to make a change when we're at the table. We need to make sure that if we get have the decision making power, that we are also making those decisions that would help the next generation come along and that they won't have to endure the things that we did because we already broke down those barriers. We've already kicked the door down and now that door that was up is no longer there. It's not about, you know, and you know, it's completely removing the door. There's no box, just operate with it so that the next generation will see how easy it is to walk in, but not taking it for granted. 
you know, that that there were challenges before they got there, but understanding what it took to get where they are and to embrace it, you know, and bring them along in those pathways so that they can now add on and and pass that message along that this was done for me. I need to, you know, pass it along. And 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 unless we do that, then we can always have these type of challenges because we know what they are. We, we, we're experiencing them now. And so we have to make sure we're helping to mitigate that so the next generation would have it much better than we did and that they will perform better than we performed, right? We don't, we, we don't want to be the teachers that said, oh, well, it was hard for me when I did, I got a B, so you need to get a B as well. We need to say, no, you need to get an A mm -hmm. because I made sure to make it a little bit more easier for you to operate. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that on so many levels. Um, I think, you know, as I'm making this transition, I feel like in my career from being more of the mentee into more of a mentor, I often think about what is my responsibility? There are times in my career I've been really frustrated, even within groups of women, like women in science at our university, where we get into the cycle of creating these lists of problems upon problems, and we're trying to solve them ourselves, but we don't have power in that group. And so I've often, with using that frustration, wondered why isn't there leadership to fix these problems for us? And I think what gives me hope is now we're seeing this generation of people that have faced these problems, probably been very frustrated with those problems, and now we're entering into a phase in our careers where we have power to make those changes. Mm -hmm. um, and so my note of caution to young people in science is, you know, speak to leadership about the problems, but recognize that you don't have to solve all the problems. You should be focusing on your science. You should be writing that next grant or that next paper or preparing your next presentation. Because I think that also creates an uneven playing field when you have the emotional and additional time burden of trying to change sy systemic issues within your workplace. That, that just holds you back even further. So I think that's something we should also reflect on. And I'll just make one other note on this point. I'm so excited we're here giving this panel. And there have been panels like this at other um, conferences. But I think it's important to be careful that we don't just pigeonhole women in science into the role of speaking about being a woman in science. I, I, and I'm happy to do it, but I want to be invited also to conferences to speak about my cutting edge science that is going to change the world. And that's what I want to share because I think there's also lessons there. So just as you are thinking about who to invite to meetings, like just be cognizant of that. Make sure that you're celebrating the science, the, the innovation behind the speakers in addition to their life's journey of being somebody that's underrepresented in science. Applause. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Amisha started to applaud uh, as well. So it's it's interesting. I'm going to ask everyone to to respond um, to the question of what do you think the future looks like for for women in innovation and invention in STEM. What what do you envision for the future? And and I want you to to think about all of these ideas of what we should be doing happening. The networking, the supporting each other, the being vulnerable, the being honest, the incorporating conversations with men and having them be our allies and aware that they are too going through some of the struggles that we're going through. So what does this future look like 30 years from now? What does the future of women look like in STEM? I'll take a first crack. I think the future will be bright, very bright. If we look at, you know, the innovation that occurred during and after the pandemic and how many people were doing different things and trying to be innovative, trying to be entrepreneurial, you can only imagine as we move further along there, more, more students are engaged, at least where I'm, I'm operated in, I'm seeing more young people from the K-12 schools. I'm seeing, you know, uh, everybody, we talk um, nationally about innovation occurs everywhere, right? And now we're seeing where then is almost going everywhere now. The opportunity is going in everywhere. When you look at the NSF engines, the art program, they're going into communities that oftentimes were marginalized, didn't have those opportunities. But in order for you to create that economic wealth that these engines are supposed to do, you have to you know, organize within all these communities, bring them along because you're trying to solve a problem that's systemic in those regions. And I think that's where you're seeing 
all of that energy and excitement is coming out. 30 years from now, I'm hoping that I will be around to see a lot of it. I think we'll have some great technology. Some of it will be extremely scary, but, but exciting at the same time, because we're seeing where, you know, from governmental agencies to foundations to nonprofit to institutions invested heavily in the young generation in making sure that they have the tools and resources that they need to be innovative and creative. And so I'm excited. I think it's, it's going to be extremely bright and extremely promising. I, I completely agree. Um, I think it's going to be very, very exciting. Um, for one, we've all expanded our horizons and eliminated some of our limitations through COVID by realizing how much we can get done by not necessarily being physically in person at everything. And I think that has expanded our horizons and our capabilities. But I'm also very excited because I am seeing the younger generation. We work with kids in elementary school and middle school with the Girl Scouts um, and getting them excited about STEM disciplines. I see it in my own kids who are in middle school. They think like amazing innovators. They're constantly thinking, I think I'm going to start this business and I think I'm going to start putting it on TikTok and it's going to bring in viewers and I'm going to make a lot of money and the money is going to buy me a brand new bike. and. They're constantly thinking in what their skills are um, and what can they do with it. And it might be simple, but that's how ideas start. I know from my family is in the hotel with me and my daughter who's in middle school has gotten to drawing artistically and her drawings are pretty good. And her thought was, I'm going to start making these drawings and turn them into greeting cards. And I'm going to start my business by putting them online selling. So they're already all thinking, they all have that mindset. So it falls on us. It's our responsibility to let that grow and not allow anything to suppress it or discourage it and not talk to them about what would limit them or what would be difficult to do or, or what might not work, but to tell them absolutely go out there and try it. Do your research and jump in and give it a try and let's see what happens. Yeah, I, I'm the oldest on this panel um, and you know I see the future just so incredibly bright and I can say that just also from the perspective of the present relative to the past over the decades I've had in the past is exceptional. So yes, there's still work to do, but in the context of this next generation and the walls that are, well, let's just first say, let's go get through the election year and then we're way past that, okay? <laughs> but the walls that are coming down and the way that Gen Z and, and future Gen Alpha, uh, as, as they go out, they look at things completely different differently. They they don't seem to have these gender stereotypes to the extent that uh, I grew up with. Uh, they look at everybody around them as just a, a, another incredible individual and what can we do together and how do we work together and they're so forward thinking. Um, I am continually shocked at, uh, at SMU, all of it, admissions and enrollment comes up through my office as well. These students are brilliant. And to your point, it's at the elementary school level too. It's not just the K to 12. So these issues that we are thinking and consciously acting on now, they have already improved. And now by 30 years down the future, we'll, we'll just be in a, in, a, in a complete idyllic society. Okay, maybe not, but it will be hugely improved. And, and I'm really looking forward to the future and to, uh, to what this generation, uh, these upcoming generations are doing. I think we're on a really great trajectory. I, I agree. I mean, I think the, the thing I've seen really grow in young people, including among my trainees in my lab, is that these young women have a voice. They have a voice, mm -hmm. and they're not afraid to use it. And that's a big shift to be able to determine what is it that you want in life, and to express that without without shame, that gives me all the hope in the world. And I think that things are going to continue to, to bloom from that. So encouraging them to have that voice is what we need to do. I'm going to build off that last bit, Cassandra, and as part of our closing comments, and I'll start with you, Amisha, and we'll work our way down through the, the panelists. As part of our closing comments, I'd, I'd like you to 
to talk to the woman mm -hmm. in, in the field and give her some advice, what is the one bit of advice that you would like to give her? Maybe someone gave you the advice and certainly feel free to share the story of who first told you. But what advice would you give the woman in the work right now at this time? Dear woman, you're here because you deserve to be here. You're here because you've earned it. You're here because you've done the work to be where you are and you deserve to be in this space, in this moment, in this time, you can do it. Um, that came from my grandmother who passed away before I even went to undergrad. My grandmother always told me that once you've given your best, no matter what it is, it may not be 100%, it may only be 70, but if that's your best, and you've given it your all, you've done all that you can, and the rest is up to the other people. And what they think of you and what they feel of, about you is no consequence of you because you've done all you can. But if you leave top on the table and you've not done your best, then you got to get up no matter what time it is and get going. Mm -hmm. So I say that to say that whoever you are, if you're listening and you're a woman and you're in this space and you have not given your best, reevaluate yourself where you are because you deserve to be in this space. But while you're in this space, make sure that you're giving your best you got. Excellent. Yeah. I would say um, start by stepping outside of your comfort zone. A lot of things are going to seem uncomfortable or um, not familiar. I think women have a tendency to only accept leadership roles or get into positions or move to the next level when they feel that they have mastered it at 100% and they can do it 100% perfectly. And we need to stop that. Mm -hmm. So you need to step outside of your comfort zone. You need to silence the self-doubt. I think most of the time that's what holds us back, our own self-doubt. We need to also um, just keep trying. We talked about perseverance. Perseverance is key. But to do it also with confidence, another skill that needs to be built um, is being confident. Elementary school girls start out very confident. By the time they get to middle school, they're doubting everything about themselves. Going back to that elementary school level of confidence is important. So those are would be my tips. And if you don't have the confidence yet, you fake it till you make it. <laughs> Not fake it till you make it. Um, there'd be two things I'd really share. I think, um, one, you don't have to do everything alone. So I've been asked a lot on panels like this about work-life balance. I've, I've uh, provost and I have five kids. Work-life balance never looks like this. This is work-life balance, and that's okay. And if you're expecting everything to balance out and be uh, perfect on both sides, absolutely not. But also, don't try and do it all alone. Have that community. So when I needed to, uh, younger, pretend, have nanny, live in nanny, do whatever you need uh, to get the help that you need. If you don't have family around, then bring people in to help. Don't try and do it all yourself, and don't expect it to look like this. It will look like this, but it's a fun seesaw at the end, especially when you look back. During the time, it might feel like you're getting seesaw sick. But when you look back, you realize it's a pretty phenomenal, uh, phenomenal life and phenomenal adventure. So uh, take, care, take advantage of that community. And if you don't have one, reach out, create one. Please realize that there's so many women and men who want to be allies, advocates, supporters, whether you have met them personally yet or not, and they're there for you, just reach out. So much advice I wish I could have given my younger self. Um, I think the first is that you deserve to be here. You deserve to be here. I think we're often some of our greatest critics, at least I am, I'm very self-critical. And so reminding myself, I deserve to be here, um, reminding my, my colleagues, they deserve to be there as well. And just to give yourself some grace. Um, I think having that that 
ability to give yourself some grace is really important because you cannot be the master of all arts. You cannot be the perfect mother. I don't think being the perfect mother is possible, period, <laughs> even if you, with or without a career. Um, give yourself some grace. I think the other the other piece of advice would be to find your people. That feeling of being alone, of not having a peer cohort can really, really mess with your success. Having others that you can have those casual gatherings with, discuss what's going on, get ideas from them, that's, that's critical to success. Um, and it really helps, I think, each other. The other would be to be less afraid of failure. You know, if you're not failing a lot, that means that you're not trying. You should be failing. Mm -hmm. And a lot, and hopefully you get some successes in the way um, along, along that journey. And I think we have to be more vocal about our failure because, on paper, you know, if if, if you look at my CV, wow, well, so accomplished, so many awards and papers and agent. No, they don't see all the times I got rejected, mm -hmm. all the times I got kicked in the teeth, right, from just really, really pointed critiques of of a paper or a grant application. And the truth to success is absorbing that, giving yourself time to process it, and then getting back up and trying again with the wisdom that you learned from whatever that lesson is. So those would be the things I would tell my, my younger self. Those are the things I tell my daughter um, is, you know, to keep trying. Mm -hmm. I, I think that that's key and, and find your people. I had wonderful advice. I feel like we have a book right here. <laughs> That last bit. Sandra will write it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, on behalf of, of the National Academy of Inventors, when this opportunity came to us, I hope you know that the reason you're here on this panel is because we knew you deserved to be on this panel. We knew that women that were watching would identify with you. We knew that the diversity of experience and perspective would reach many. And we knew that collectively, you would probably connect with one another. And this may be the start of the NAI women's group. Very fantastic. Which we've been talking about doing. We at the Academy are, are also working as part of our partnership with the USPTO on launching a speakers bureau. And we're paying very close attention to who we ask to be a part of that speakers bureau and the opportunities that we place them in and where we advertise that they could go, because so many of, of you commented on the importance of seeing a woman mm -hmm. doing what it is that you envision that you would like to do. So as a, a, a heads up, expect a follow-up from the <laughs> Academy um, to take this panel discussion on the road. Mm -hmm. I want to thank the USPTO for creating this opportunity to live stream this panel today.